I can't believe that we're so honored to have someone as distinguished as Dr. Edwards. Um, Rochelle has worked so hard on, on this introduction and the work to, to have Dr. Edwards here. So I decided I was just going to read what she wrote because it's very good. And I, why, why reinvent something? So, um, so I want to thank you, Betty, for the introduction. And here goes um, the notes and um, speech from Rochelle. When I was growing up, pro sports was seen as a refuge. We flocked to football stadiums, basketball courts, and baseball parks to leave life's serious concerns behind. Sure, Red Sox hated Yankees with passion, but society's problems, they had no place at the game. Or did they? Dr. Harry Edwards has long seen sports as a mirror of society and a potential instrument of social change. A pioneer who developed the sociology of sports as an academic discipline. After three decades of teaching thousands of students at UC Berkeley, Dr. Edwards is now Professor Emeritus of Sociology. He's moved so many in the world of sports, from the playing fields to the front offices, to team up their values with their social standing to further social justice. The founder of a social movement with global relevance and reach, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, his counsel inspired the now legendary Black Power salute protest by Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Mexico City Summer Olympics. And I have a feeling that most of us here um, have that in, in our stories, in our minds. It's something that's just outstanding and certainly in mine. World-renowned sociologist Dr. Edwards has also been a diversity consultant for all three major U.S. sports, baseball, basketball, and football. From 1987 through 1995, he worked with NBA's Golden State Warriors, <laughs> uh, the programs and methods he developed to deal with the issues and challenges pro football players face were adopted by the NFL in 1992. Today, scholar activist Dr. Edwards is the leading authority on developments at the intersection of race, sports, and society. He'll tell us how sports are infused with society's cultural and political issues and the significance of that for our political and social climate. After his talk, he will answer some of our questions. And now, I'm proud to introduce to all of you Rochelle's sports hero since her college days many decades ago at Cornell University, Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much for that, for that introduction. Uh, after we finish here, I want you to uh, I want you to introduce me to that guy because he sounds like he's a pretty decent dude. Uh, I, they got me mic'd up here, and then there's a mic here, so I, I don't. Sometimes this doesn't work. Um, the devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was way behind and running out of time, and was willing to make a deal. Can you? Did, did that come back out there? Did you get? Okay, good. Let's uh, then. Get right into it. I'm not going to, I'm going to stick pretty close to my notes so that I don't wind up taking all the time because this is a huge subject that I've taught on, talked about for the last half century. Um, and so I want to limit this uh, so that we have time for questions and some dialogue and exchange. Sport has traditionally been seen in Western societies as the tar department of human affairs. It's been seen as an area where adults, play children's games made more difficult, more dangerous, and uh, more costly. The reality is that sport is an institution of Western society and has been since uh, the very outset of, civil, of this civilization. The central theme of my dissertation at Cornell University, which I could get virtually nobody to buy into, but they let me do it anyway, um, was that sport inevitably recapitulates human and institutional relationships in society and the ideological and value sentiments framing and justifying 
those relationships. The implication, implications of this simple uh, proposition are profound and pervasive in both sport and society. Since the turn of the 20th century in particular, sport uh, has uh, had an influence on how we see each other and how we understand our social system. Broad scale circumstances and conditions have framed and fueled developments at the interface of sport, race, and society in particular. In consequence, intergenerational waves of black athletes have been uh, prompted uh, to activism on behalf of and within the context of social change movements and causes, both within and beyond the sports arena. In 1896, we, there uh, occurred this edict from the United States Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, this was uh, seen, even at the time, as an odious decision, but what it did was to establish as the law of the land uh, concepts and perceptions of white supremacy and race-linked black inferiority. Though the decision was widely deemed uh, a mandate for separate but equal, uh, though the concept does not appear anywhere in the decision or in, uh, the, even in the uh, dissenting uh, remarks, commentary by John Harlan, as uh, the sole dissenter of the court, uh, Justice John Harlan noted, Plessy versus Ferguson has the acknowledged goal and likely impact of reducing black people to circumstances as close to the, as close to the subjugation, subsistence, and uh, subservience of slavery as possible without using the word. That was never any intent for blacks to be separate but equal. From the outset, the goal was to reduce blacks to, a cir to circumstances as close to slavery as possible without using the word. In other words, the pur purposes of Plessy versus Ferguson and uh, the, um, was the abject segregation and subservience of black people. It institutionalized by law uh, these uh, characteristics of black circumstances uh, and was never intended to prompt separate but equal and parallel black cultural and social structures, institutions, civic and political organizations, or for that matter, a parallel black sports institution. Thus, the organized sports activities and achievements of African Americans, both domestically and internationally, from the exploits of uh, Jack Johnson, Jesse Owens, and Joe Lewis in the international uh, sports realm to the demonstrable excellence of black athletes uh, competing domestically in uh, such uh, structures as the Negro Leagues were basically a resistance movement. This also uh, held for uh, such sports organizations as the Washington DC Bears and the Harlem Renaissance basketball teams uh, who often competed against uh, black professional teams, not just pick up games and barnstorming tours of uh, uh, various areas of the United States, but competed against professional teams, segregated professional teams, and in many instances, most instances, in fact, won those games. The um, uh, Washington, D.C. Bears won 63 straight games uh, during uh, one season, the last season that they had, and after that, nobody would play them again. <laughs> Uh, from the onset of the 20th century until the end of uh, World War II and um, the onset of the desegregation effort, pressures toward desegregation in American society uh, created what was a second wave of sports activism. But the, that second wave built upon the first wave. The first wave was about a struggle for legitimacy. 
that notion from Plessy versus Ferguson that blacks were by race-linked heritage, inferior, physically, intellectually, uh, most certainly athletically, uh, was challenged. The 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis were called the Racial Olympics. And what they did was to go out into the black communities surrounding St. Louis, bring in black people off the street, put them on the field, uh, in exhibition demonstrations against trained white athletes, and when the white athletes inevitably won, they said, see there, I told you, they're, 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 they're inferior. Uh, this was uh, a, a general perspective on African Americans. This was what was challenged in that first wave of athletes. It's not accidental that they had that first wave of athletes, Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens, uh, Paul Robeson, had their greatest uh, triumphs and generated their greatest respect abroad. Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics, Joe Lewis when he beat Max Smelling in a return bout in 1938, another international triumph. And of course, Jack Johnson followed white uh, champions all over the world until finally he did get a fight with Tommy Burns, a Canadian, uh, in Australia, where he became the first black heavyweight champion of the world. It's not accidental that Paul Robeson was able to parlay his athletic accomplishments, the first Walter Camp African-American, All-American, uh, into a, a career singing and in the theater and so forth, but he could sing and perform before royalty in Europe, years before he could sing and perform on the stages at Carnegie Hall in New York City in his own country. So the focus tended to be international in that struggle for legitimacy because I don't care how many times the Negro Leagues uh, domestically beat the white all-stars in these barnstorming trips that they took and the Negro League all-stars would be beat them six, over 60% of the time, they were not seen as legitimate. They were seen as, well, that's just what they do because that's what their instincts are. They don't work hard. They don't study the game. They don't understand the game. Whatever they do well and it turns out well, it's an accident. That struggle of the first wave was for legitimacy. The first wave also modeled for the rest of society. They modeled behavior. They modeled the resistance for the rest of society. So just as the Negro Leagues fought for le legitimacy domestically, and you had Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis and Jack Johnson fighting for legitimacy internationally, there was a two-pronged struggle for legitimacy. When World War II broke out, and they were looking for an incentive for black people to go and fight for democracy in Europe that they didn't enjoy here. The way it was done was to craft a double V struggle. And so in every store window, in every home window in the black community during World War II, they had what they called uh, the double V uh, in the window. Dem this fight for democracy at home, is equal to the fight for democracy abroad. These were in the windows of black businesses and homes all over the country during World War II. The second wave was built upon the first wave. It came in the wake of what America saw, what black Americans saw as a race war against Aryan superiority in Germany, against Japanese imperialism, and against fascist notions of superiority in Italy. From the onset of uh, the post-World War II years, a second wave then emerged uh, where the struggle was for access. This was the second part of that V. They had de defeated Racism in the sense of Aryan superiority in Europe, now was, this was the struggle to defeat racism at home. Uh, the major players in that sports drama were drawn from the ranks of the athletes developed in the first wave, uh, from the Negro Leagues, from uh, the basketball uh, teams, segregated basketball teams, and so forth. 
Others had experience in nominally desegregated sports organizations where uh, the uh, hotel accommodations were often separate. Eating accommodations were separate. Living accommodations uh, were separate. Uh, but these athletes came out of that first wave of athlete, athlete resistance with that heritage of resistance. Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby in baseball. Kenny Washington and Woody Strode in football. Chuck Cooper and Earl Lloyd in basketball, along with Sweetwater Clifton. They crossed the color line in their sports and kept the door open for coming generations of black athletes, not just because of their presence there, but they carried out an ongoing struggle and resistance while they were there. I'm convinced, uh, having known Jackie Robinson and talked to him and, and, and seen him turn gray, totally gray, by the time he was 50 years old, uh, his early death came as a result of that struggle, the burden of that struggle. A lot of that stress, I think, showed up uh, in his, um, uh, the, the, the reasons for his demise. The uh, society uh, was in a post-World War II era where they were in a life and death struggle with national communism, who, uh, which was using the segregation in America as a foil against America with third world, largely non-white labor, resource, and market-rich nations. They would go to Africa and say, what do you mean, America? is on your side. They're not even on the side of the black folks in the country. They would go to Asia and say, look at, the, uh, look at California. Look at the uh, Asian exclusion laws that are still on the books in California. Look at what they did to the Japanese during World War II. They would go to S South America and say, show me in South, show me in the United States where Latinos have an equal chance, even though they too are defined in some instances as white. Show me where that exists. And so the United States had to begin to desegregate along with the pressure from black society itself. That struggle was about access, was about eliminating segregation. And it set the model, just as the first wave of black athletes set the model for the double V uh, disposition in post-World War II years leading up to World War II and into World War II, coming out of World War II, it was the athletes who set the model for the civil rights movement. Black folks in this country didn't know anything about Gandhi, probably couldn't have spelled his name, and if they had known something about him and his activities in South Africa in particular, they wouldn't have been very impressed. But what they did know about was Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, set the model for nonviolent direct action a whole decade before Dr. King ever led the Montgomery bus boycott. Jackie Robinson stated in his autobiography in 1972, I was so proud of black people, the preachers and pastors, and the lay community organizers who trained black people on how to behave in the stands because they understood the same thing that I did. That if I got into a rhubarb on the field, assuming my teammates would come out and help me, we'd have a fight on the field. But if a fight broke out in the stands, it could spill over into the streets, into a race riot, and no city would want the Dodgers to come and play with me on the field because they would use that as an excuse to shut the whole thing down. We, I succeeded, not just because I turned the other cheek, but those black people sitting in the stands also heard, who also heard the epithets, saw the black cats thrown on the field, saw people sliding into second base with their spikes up trying to hurt me. They saw that, but they responded in a nonviolent way. This was from 1946 to 1956 when Dr. King took over the Montgomery bus boycott. He modeled the civil rights movement. We already were into nonviolent direct action for a whole decade 
before Dr. King um, ever came on the scene. So in 1957, out of recognition of that, Howard University together gave Dr. King and J Jackie Robinson together honorary doctorates because they recognized it was one struggle. But Jackie didn't come from Dr. King. Jackie primed the pump for Dr. King. We were into nonviolent direct action long before we ever heard of Gandhi. Jackie Robinson was our Gandhi. That is the uh, reality of that, of that situation. That was the second wave of athlete activists. By the mid-1960s, a third wave of athlete activism was already well this side of the sports political horizon. This time, it was framed by the emergence of the black power movement, just as the first wave had been framed up by conditions and circumstances in a society of abject segregation. And the second wave was framed up by a new ideological push for desegregation. This third wave was framed up by the black power movement. Younger athletes and beneficiaries of the second wave struggle for access by 1967 uh, had already determined that uh, expanding um, overrepresentation in revenue producing sports uh, was exploitive so long as there was no black access to authority and decision making positions, so long as there was not equal access to endorsements, so long as there was not E equality in terms of all of the benefits that should be coming to an athlete based upon his or her uh, competitive um, uh, capabilities. So you had coming out of that situation um, this response to what had emerged as a plantation system where black athletes were reduced to little more than 20th century gladiators in uh, support of substantially white profit-making institutions, whether collegiate or professional. Uh, the, at the professional level, more than one black athlete raised the question of why players were regularly recruited and hired into the ranks of general managers, head coaches, assistant coaches, and so forth, but not black players, even though they were actually often stars of the teams that they played on. White players became general managers, assistant coaches, front office personnel, but not black players. Bill Russell raised that question. Jim Brown raised that question. At the collegiate level, I raised the issue at San Jose State, which made uh, people uh, in the NC2A and in other institutional settings, not to speak of San Jose State itself, think that I was totally insane. I raised the issue of why should we play where we can't work? Why should we play where we can't work? And at that point, people began to say, hey, good question. And nobody had an answer. So uh, that third generation of, uh, that third wave of athlete activists, was about uh, human rights. It wasn't about civil rights. It wasn't about uh, getting a law passed. It was about being respected uh, as full, equal human beings uh, with all of the dignity and so forth that that brings with it. So you had people like Arthur Ashe, who saw not only the human rights struggle here in this country, but he saw it as a continuum. He focused on South Africa and that situation. You had Jim Brown, who said, I played football for respect. I didn't play for the money. I didn't play for because I knew I could play. I played for respect. I wanted everybody, when I took the field, to say, uh-oh, we got, we got our work cut out for us today. And I saw that happen. The first time I ever saw Jim Brown play, um, a roommate of mine who was on the Cleveland Browns, an individual by the name of Walt Roberts, invited me to a game that they played at Keysar Stadium at the time. St uh, the 49ers were playing at Keysar Stadium, 1964. 
And um, the team's out working, working out and getting ready, warming up for the game. All of a sudden, I'm in the stands. I look up and everything is stopped. Everything stopped cold. The 49ers coaches, the players, the people in the stands, everything, everybody looking at the other end. And I look up and it's Jim Brown's coming out of the thing, doing a few push-ups, a few stretching exercises. He had that kind of respect. That's who and what he was. Uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, when we organized the Olympic Project for Human Rights, it wasn't about civil rights, it was about human rights. It was about human rights. We had moved beyond civil rights because we understood that that didn't get it done. In point of fact, it was leaving millions of people uh, behind. Bill Russell, uh, the first black professional head coach in the country. He was pursuing human rights. Uh, Kurt Flood, who uh, they tabbed a uh, $80,000, uh, who called himself an $80,000 a year uh, slave because he wasn't concerned about the money. He was concerned about the, how can they come to my team one morning and tell me I got to pull my family out, out, out of town, sell my house, pull my kids out of school, and move someplace else because an owner who's not, never even around has decided he wants to get two players from another team. So he said, I'm not going to do it. So they, they, he forced free agency, which was about human rights. Uh, the goals of this third wave of activism then were dignity and respect as human beings, uh, old and entitled to the full, uh, unimpeded range of rights, respect, and so forth as anyone else, both within and outside of the arena. And of course, the godfather of that third wave was Muhammad Ali. He was the first to stand up and say, I want respect for my name. I want respect for my religion. I have the same right as a human being as anyone else to stand up and say, I object on grounds of uh, religious uh, commitment. And he compelled them, this society, to respect that. By 1972, the civil rights movement had declined um, in the wake of Dr. King's assassination in 1968, and a leadership vacuum was created. Uh, and the movements uh, that had been so strong uh, for decades began to decline. Let me uh, say something, digress very, very quickly here. If you go back and look at these resistance movements, they fall basically into two categories. There are those that are centralized, organized, well-focused, goal-oriented, uh, and there are those that are uh, what I call proto-hashtag movements. Uh, the well-organized, centralized leadership, focused, goal-oriented are like the civil rights movement under Dr. King. They last about 10 years. You can go back to Marcus Garvey, who started his movement in 1917. By 1927, he was gone. You look at the civil rights movement. Dr. King took over the helm of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956. By 1966, the pastors had turned against him. The young folks had turned against him. Stoker Carmichael had seized the bullhorn. And Dr. King was looking for a way to get back at the head of the parade that he had started. And so he began to side with the younger people in terms of the Vietnam War. He began to talk about human rights rather than civil rights. This is how he got into the economic protest, the, what he proposed as a poor people's march. This was about human rights. This wasn't about civil rights. And so the solid, centered, led, organized, clearly defined movements of resistance last about 10 years. The proto-tag movements, proto-hashtag movements last about six years. And so the black power movement, which Stokely Carmichael first enunciated in 1966, by 1972 was over. It was over. And so uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith could demonstrate 
in Mexico City in 1968, two years after the Black Power Movement took off. And what they did, what was articulated around what they did within the context of the Black Power Movement for Human Rights, what they did became what is today recognized as the most iconic sports image of the 20th century. But by 1972, Vince Matthews and Wayne Collette staged the demonstration in Munich against racism, police violence, and so forth in America during the playing of the national anthem. Nobody even remembers it. The Black Power Movement was virtually dead at that point. And it wasn't that, well, they had the killing of the Jewish athletes in 1972. In Mexico City, 1,300 students were shot down by soldiers and police during the course of the Olympic Games. There were so many bodies that they were literally flying them out over the ocean in fishnets and dumping them because they did not want mass funeral uh, entourages during the playing of the games. So it's not the killing that deflected it. It's the fact that the framing of it was gone. The Black Power Movement was dead. The Black Panther Party started in 1966 over here at Merritt College. Uh, by Huey, Newton. By 1972, it was over. By 1972, uh, Bobby Seale was running for mayor, Elaine Brown was running for city council, and Eldridge Cleaver was running for president. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, the Black Panther Party went into a more traditional structure in 1972 and were, were literally serving food that came partly out of funds provided by the state. The Black Panther Party started the Head Start movement. The Black Panther Party was running schools, charter schools, funded partially out of money from the county and the city, the school district. They went normal in 1972. But guess what? 10 years later, 1982, the Black Panther Party was officially disbanded, literally 10 years later. That's the history that we're dealing with in this situation. And I'll come back to this a bit later. The, in consequence, then, between 1972 and approximately 2012, there was an era of athlete compliance with established definitions of social and political reality, with some notable exceptions, namely Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, who refused to stand at attention for, on religious grounds to Olympics. Abdul Raouf, if for those of you who don't know, was Steph Curry before Steph Curry. I mean, I watched, I watched Mahmoud put up 50 on Michael Jordan. At one point, they started out with Pippen guarding him. Then they put somebody else on him. Then it was Pippen, Michael, and somebody else. And he just, pew, pew, he just kept moving back, you know. And so uh, he refused to stand uh, for the national He prayed during the national anthem because he said, it's against my religion to accede to a lie. Home of the uh, free, land of the free and home of the brave, my people are not free. And so he was suspended, and in point of fact, his career was over. Uh, Craig Hodges, same thing. Craig Hodges had the audacity after they won the uh, national championship at the Bulls, Chicago Bulls, I believe it was 1992, when he went into the White House and uh, met with George uh, uh, Bush one to hand him a note saying, Mr. President, could you please do more for minorities and Native Americans and poor people in this country? They are suffering out here. And as a consequence of that, he had played his last game. Uh, so there were some exceptions, but for the most part, athletes acceded to the authority definitions. You know, that everything is cool, you're all right, we're in a, we're in a post-racial era. There was no ideology framing anything up. The civil rights movement was over, the black power movement was dead. Nothing else had emerged. And so it was possible for an athlete uh, of, of international standing to say, 
uh, when asked to support a black candidate opposing Jesse Helms, the arch racist in the United States Senate against civil rights, it was possible for this athlete to say, well, Republicans buy gym shoes too. It was possible at a time when athletes had literally modeled, uh, had a history of modeling the civil rights struggle and resistance for Charles Barkley to say, I'm not a role model and get away with it because there was no way to frame that up and say, hey, man, wait a minute. Where are you coming from with that? Um, so that was a period between 1972 and 2012 when there was no ideology framing things up. But then in 2012, three black women came up with a hashtag that, marked, that, that morphed into a slogan that morphed into a movement, Black Lives Matter. And at that point, even the president had to step up and say, yeah, Trayvon Martin could have been my son. Why? Because there was something that framed it up in the broader society. And that's, it's not accidental at that time that athletes also began to stand up. And so you had Colin Kaepernick taking a knee in 2016, right, 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 in, 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 in the middle of that. Four years later, he's taking a knee, but it didn't start that. It started in 2012 when the Miami Heat wore hoodies saying Black Lives Matter. Colin Kaepernick took it to the next level. He started taking a knee. And at that point in a social media world, it went viral. And the reality is that the sports world, not a society, knew how to handle that. It's one man taking a knee with th three million people uh, re retweeting that picture. Is he leading three million people or is it just three million people who thought this was it? Th th nobody knows how to manage that. And so when Colin and I talked about it, I said, hey, whatever you do is going big. And I was so sure of that after he took a knee, I went into the locker room at the 49ers and got his jersey and those shoes and had them autograph them and sent them back to the Smithsonian. <laughs> and Lonnie Bunch called me up and said, Harry, what, what, the, what is this? Why are you sending me this? This guy's out there taking a knee and everybody's ripping him and you sending me his shoes and jersey. I said, because you need to put it right next to Ali's stuff because that's where it belongs. Well, where does, it, where, where does this come in? I know you all did this in 1968, but where did, wh wh how does a protest doing the anthem come in now? I said, no, no, no. I said, you got to go back further than 1968. Jackie Robinson, I cannot stand and sing the anthem. I cannot salute the flag. I know that I am a black man in a white world. You got to go back further than 1968. You can accuse them of a lot of things, but you can't accuse them of not doing our homework. Uh, and so there's a tradition of protest in that regard. Let me uh, jump ahead because I, I want to save some time for questions. The Black Lives Matter movement, like the Black Power movement, is on the clock. In point of fact, by 2018, it had already played out. In 2018, there were seven athletes who were protesting. Why? It's on the clock, six years, and it dissipates. And if you go online to the San Jose State University website, I started an institute for the study of sports society and social change down there. And on that website is an article that I wrote called It Is Time. And it explains the dynamics of why that is, why it is inevitable. And so now, we're looking at the next wave. And it's already well this side of the sports political horizon. And what is the big ideological defining structure out there now? The Me Too movement. Well, what does that tell me? That the next wave is going to be about sport and gender. And already, the WNBA has committed to give $5 out of every ticket to Planned Parenthood because they realize something, that while everybody points to Title IX in 1972, 
as opening up sports for women because it mandated parity, that what really made the whole system work was Roe v. Wade in 1973 because those schools, those professional uh, leagues that signed contract with these women had some assurance that if I signed them in September, they're going to be around in March to play in the March Madness. They're going to be around in June to run an NCAA championships. They're going to be around in August to play in the WNBA championships. And so now, not only are women's advances under attack, but Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood in particular are under attack. In Texas, they had 44 women's clinics about five years ago. It's now down to 14, and only four of those have admissions, hospital admissions rights, which means they can't perform abortions. They can't have anything to do with anything morning after pills. University of Texas named a lecture series for me, Dr. Harry Edwards Lecture Series. I, I was tremendously gratified, a deep south school which uh, when I came out in 1960 as a scholarship athlete, the only way I could have got on the ca walked on the campus was with a rake or mop in my hand. And now they want to start, they start this lecture series, which I finally had to walk away from because uh, uh, the state legislature passed this uh, concealed carry uh, law that it meant that students on campus could come to class with guns, and I'm not going to be anywhere lecturing and don't know whether a sucker is reaching down to get a pencil or whether he, he, did, he didn't like something I said, you know. So, so I, I told him I have to disassociate myself with that. But I met a lot of young people down there, a lot of young women, a lot of young athletes. And this one lady called me and said, Dr. Edwards, you know, I had to drive almost 500 miles uh, to get the services that I need because uh, they had a waiting list of two months. I couldn't wait two months. You know, and this is not even beginning to deal with what is happening on campuses uh, where you have these star athletes dating these ladies who can't get the services that they need. And so you have some athletic departments that are literally running daycare centers because these women are smart enough to know, hey, this guy is going to be drafted. And if you think that I'm going to let this situation knock me out of my money? Uh-uh, no, I'm going to be right here. And so now you've got this situation going on. It's not just the women who are affected. It's the men, too. And so there's this rising movement among women because they see an existential threat to women's sports by these attacks on Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood. Uh, I know women already who are passing around uh, online addresses and contacts to clinics in Norway and in Denmark where they can have stuff brought in because it's just too difficult in states like North Carolina and Texas and other increasing number of others to get the services that they need safe when they need them. And so this next wave is going to be about gender. These athletes face an existential threat to the very existence of the sports that they participate in. So enjoy the women's uh, basketball championship game today. Enjoy the WNBA season and women's soccer and softball and so forth because unless this situation is turned around, uh, it's going to be uh, right back to the good old days. Uh, because there are those who are committed to making America great again. Uh, so what we need to understand also is that men have a role in this. The NBA players need to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, uh, this is not right. Uh, the men active in the movement need to stand up and say, this is not right. We're with you. Cheerleaders have been taking a knee over issues raised by male athletes. Uh, we need to return the favor. Um, 
there's so much more that I could say, but I'm going to let this go so, so, we, can get so we can get some questions. All right, all right thank you. Okay, good, good. Go right here. <laughs> so, thank you, Dr. Edwards. So at this point, uh, we're going to see if there's any questions from the audience. Please write them down on a piece of paper and, and someone will be picking them up. Should college athletes be paid as professionals? Do you have an opinion about that? Um, I, just, um, I just finished a script. Um, in my later years, I've gotten into a lot of documentary scripts. I just finished this movie. If you go on Netflix and look up High Flying Bird, uh, I have a cameo role at the very end, but throughout they're flashing the revolt of the black athlete, my book, and so forth. And then, the, and I, I'll leave the end. I won't say what the end is, but go on and check it out. But stay for the last. Uh, but uh, it's only for a second, but I'm absolutely awful. <laughs> uh, but I just finished the um, sequel to it, and, one, and the theme is that athletes need to be paid. Need to be paid. Uh, this notion that um, athletes, especially in sports, uh, revenue-producing sports of football and basketball, uh, have to uh, maintain their amateurism in order to be pure and, 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 and to function and so forth as they should, is nonsense. It's, there's no way that they can justify that anymore. You have coaches, uh, the top 25 football coaches in this country and Division I make between four and a half and nine and a half million dollars a year. You have assistant coaches making a million and a half dollars a year. Everybody is organized from the universities themselves right on down to the trainers and doctors and so forth, and they are all pushing for more money, except for one individual, the guy on whose back the money is uh, whose, whose efforts generate the money, the athletes. Um, and they well, well, we can't afford it. Well, University of North Carolina two years ago uh, made $20.9 million on basketball. The out-of-state tuition at the University of North Carolina uh, is approximately $50,000. Uh, they have uh, what they call the option, not the obligation, the option of giving a cost of living stipend to make up for the shortfall between what the scholarship pays and what is needed to live at the level of the average student on campus. The average Division I scholarship athlete lives below the poverty line. Uh, at the University of North Carolina, if they recruited every athlete on the basketball team from out of state and gave them the stipend, it would come to about $650,000, less than 3% of what they made in just one year. And uh, they said, well, we can't afford it. Well, no, you can't afford it if greed uh, and degeneracy and exploitation is the, uh, is the rule. And when you look at the fact that only 2% of these athletes will ever sign a professional contract, and within three years, uh, all but one of them will still be, will be gone from the league you realize that these kids are being ripped off. Not only that, but the concussion issue means that it is going to be the NFL and Division I football, which is the, uh, a multi-billion dollar industry, is going to be virtually all black in terms of who's on the field. I'm not talking about who's on the roster. You can put Bozo and Ronald McDonald on the roster, but it's talking about who you put on the field. And if you look out on the field, <coughs> Look at last year's Super Bowl. Look at Clemson playing Alabama. It looked like Ghana playing Nigeria because that's who is playing the football game. Uh, USA football is down by almost 30 percent. Pop Warner football is down, was do dropped 20% over the last two years, and it was already down by 17 percent. Why? Because white folks are saying, if the cost of playing football is that my son is not going to be able to find his way to the bathroom in his own house by the time he's 45 years old. We don't need football. You got Hall of Fame football players who are saying, my son can't play football. You got, you got uh, 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 people in political office who vote against paying athletes saying, my son can't play football. But they go to these black communities and they get these black kids, one whose parents a lot of times haven't gotten a word about concussions. Uh, 
Secondly, they don't trust the medical profession anyway, going back to uh, the Tuskegee uh, test and, and the apartheid medical system that we have in this country. And third, football is a way out. It's a way not out, not just out for the kids, they believe, but maybe for the whole family. We can all do better if he can make it to the league. And so blacks are becoming more and more prevalent in football. The NFL in two college generations is going to be blacker than the NBA ever dreamed of being because you got these foreign athletes coming in playing in the NBA. But American football, you got to grow up taking those hits. You got to know that if I got one guy here and can see uh, four others in front of me, hey, you know what? There are six others somewhere, and one of them may be coming to ear hold me. You grow up so that you know that that instinctually, you don't have to look around because by the time you look around, it's too late. You grow up taking those hits. This is an American sport, and the Americans who are playing it are black, <coughs> but you still have the same structural situation. All the ownership is white with the exception of one foreign guy. All of the coaches for the practice. Last year there were seven black coaches. This year there are two. Along with Ron Rivera, Latino, my guy from Cal. Uh, and last year there were uh, five black GMs. This year there's one. It follows the ideological character of human and institutional relationships in society and in the age of Trump. And look around and say, what do we need them for? We need them on the field, not in the front office. So um, uh, this, uh, this, whole, um, this whole situation is in flux, but it's one that's, uh, that, 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 that's, really worth, uh, that's really worth watching. I don't, know, I don't know if I answered your question or not. I think you did. I think you did. You actually answered one of the additional questions, which is about um, does the NFL owner profit and the um, NFL profit? Player income combined to stifle any chance of change. I think you kind of covered. Well, yeah, I, 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 but I, I think you have to also look at the NFL Players Association when it comes to this. The NFL Players Association never took a stand in terms of the Colin Kaepernick situation when he was suspended. They say it wasn't a labor issue, it was a political issue. Well, when you get to that level, everything is political. Uh, the fact that um, uh, so many athletes leave crippled, broken up, uh, if it wasn't for Obamacare, which eliminates uh, uh, not insuring people because of previous existing conditions, they'd be, most of them would be uh, totally, totally homebound. One of the things that you really should be looking at in terms of this and that the league, that the Players Association has no policy, no stand on, is the demands on the athlete's body. Uh, today, when I was an athlete, you grew up, uh, and if you were pretty good, somebody say, hey, he's a pretty nice little athlete. Then all of a sudden you begin to play basketball, football, and track, you know, and say, oh, man, this guy's good throwing the discus, and he's a hell of a tight end, and he, he can play center in, in, in basketball. Then by the time you're recruited to college, well, what do you play? I play uh, basketball, and I play, uh, I'm, I'm a discus thrower, but football is my sport. And then all of a sudden, well, he's a pretty good discus thrower. He could play center in basketball. Today, from the earliest age, kids are choreographed and grown like cattle for one position. In 2007, I did a study of the uh, high school top 100 players in Rivals.com. And I looked at the offensive and defensive linemen. 2007 was the year that Tony Dungy won the Super Bowl. Tony Dungy's offensive and defensive lines averaged 304 pounds. The 17 and 18 year olds coming out of high school in the top 100 averaged 290.4. So now, in 19, in uh, um, uh, uh, 1970, uh, there was one athlete in the NFL that weighed 300 pounds. By the time Bill Walsh won his first Super Bowl in 1981, there were three. In 1990, there were 94. In 2000, uh, there were over 200. Today, there are over 400 athletes in the NFL who weigh over 300 pounds. And there are no services that say, hey, you got to get this under control. This is diabetes. This is cancer. This is a heart attack. This is blood pressure. This is all of this. Uh, so we have a lot of guys wandering around with bad knees who can't walk. They're sitting watching TV, eating, and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I know one guy who played 
at 300 pounds. He's now close to 500. So at the end of the day, you have to have a players association that looks at the totality of what is going on. So when you ask about ownership, yeah, ownership has a role. Ownership has an obligation. But the organized people who uh, are supposed to be representing athletes have an even greater obligation. Unfortunately, uh, the model was set kind of by Gene Upshaw. When he was approached about these issues, his perspective was, I represent active players. I don't represent retired players. And those guys are just out there turning in the wind. We have so, we have so many questions. Uh, I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Um, can you comment on the impact of the Williams sisters, including internationally? It's not anything close to what it ought to be. Um, this is probably the greatest sibling uh, athlete duo in modern history, without question. Uh, I know Serena. Um, we've, I've done programs with her. Uh, she's not only beautiful, powerful, uh, determined, focused, uh, a mother, all of those great things. Uh, I mean, she is walking evidence of why women are the greatest, the most creative force uh, on this planet, second only to Mother Earth herself. Uh, and we need, to, we need to understand that and we need to, to, to utilize those images to get, uh, to get uh, men and, and everybody, even many women, uh, to understand that. I think that if Venus and Serena were white, uh, that would be a Williams Tower somewhere in main you know, midtown Manhattan. You know, they, they would be, but, but, but they're not. They're black, they're from Compton, they're outspoken, they're committed, they're great. They don't fit the uh, image that uh, so uh, much of uh, American, America and Western society in general uh, wants to uh, compress women into, uh, and uh, as a consequence, they don't get nearly the credit. They're not nearly the models uh, that they could be, not just for young black girls, but for all girls, for all women. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, as a consequence of that, uh, we're at a loss. Uh, I, I, uh, I could say so much more, but I know, uh, I know Serena, and, I, and, I, and at some point it'll, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll, become, uh, it'll become personal. I had to tell my wife, you know what, I think I'm in love. You know, and she, <laughs> she, did, she said, well, I hope it's with me. I said, of course, sweetheart, you know. But uh, um, yeah, we, we could do so much better with regard to the Williams sisters. No, go ahead. You're cool. Okay. Um, this college scandals, um, parents bringing, buying their child's admission. The same thing happens in high school sports. Wealthy parents buy their children's position on the team, particularly soccer and football, uh, to surpass the more qualified player. How do you suggest we handle this situation? Uh, you know, it, it's uh, sport reflects society. You know. Um, we, we have to we have to be out you, you can be honest when you can't be right and 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 one of the things we need to be honest about is that money makes a difference in American society always has uh, doesn't necessarily always will be that way but it, it makes a difference uh, and uh, some of it has to do with the way that they that they frame these things up I mean you get this guy comes in buying spaces at places like Stanford and, and, and USC and so forth. And he said, well, I created a side door. No, that wasn't a side door. If the front door is going through regular admissions and the back door is what they call legacy admissions where somebody then, somebody's granddaddy gave a building or helped to sta you know, stabilize the finances of the university, uh, the side door is where they bring in athletes and artists and others under special admissions. He didn't come through no side door because nobody knew about it. We know about the athletes. We know when somebody's brought in under special admissions because, you know, he's 6'2", 245 pounds and run a, runs a 4'3", 40. Uh, and, 
uh, you know, can, can turn the light out and be in the bed before the room gets dark. I mean, you, 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 you know that. But uh, um, uh, so, so th th this idea that he was bringing them through the side door is nonsense. He didn't bring them through the side door. He brought them through the basement. All of a sudden, you look up, a trap door opens, and these damn people standing there amongst regular uh, 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 admits uh, and so forth. They got them on track teams. I mean, they had this one young guy, his folks paid through a track coach. You can look at this guy, you, he couldn't run out of sight if you gave him all day. You know, uh, 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 so, somebody coming in on, on a, a volleyball team who couldn't hit his plate with his fork. I mean, so you get, you get these people in there, and you say, well, I brought them through the side door. No, he didn't bring them through the side door. He brought them through the basement. They came up through a trap door, and all of a sudden, he's just standing there amidst uh, these honorable uh, students uh, who came in through the front door or the back door or the side door. There are a lot of doors, but he brought these kids in. Through. We need to frame this up for what it is. It was a low-life, degenerate uh, scheme, uh, and not just in terms of paying the money, but they knocked somebody out of a place when they did it. Uh, so, uh, we, we, we can, again, we, we, can, we can be honest about this. Uh, when we can't be right. But if you look at the situation with the athletes in North Carolina where they had somebody taking their tests and everything to keep them eligible, I wrote an article in 1981, maybe, called the Collegiate Athletic Arms Race. And uh, uh, what I talked about was it was inevitable, following the model uh, that had been laid out in military science, that uh, you were going to get into an arms race as the money got bigger and bigger in collegiate athletics. Somebody got a new stadium, you got to have one with two more seats. Somebody hired a coach for a million dollars, you got to hire one for 1.5. Somebody brings in a seven footer, you got to get find somebody who's seven two. And the athletes became the big guns, the aircraft carriers, so forth that you bring in to make sure your system is viable. And if you can't, it doesn't make any difference whether they're straight A students, you're gone. Uh, because somebody else is going to recruit that kid, they're going to beat you, and not one person on your campus is going to say, yeah, but you lost with eight students. You got some Phi Beta Kappa guys out there who can't, you know, hit a basket. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, hey, we won't get somebody in here who's going to recruit that athlete. So we're into a collegiate athletic arms race that is out of control. Uh, this is a side kind of an issue that uh, took place with regard to these parents uh, and this, uh, this money. And if they hadn't sent it, uh, used the mail and electronic uh, communications to set the deal up, uh, they probably wouldn't have anything on them. Okay. Two more questions. I'm going to combine this, uh, two of them together and then one last question for you. Uh, so that we also have time to kind of meet and greet you, if that's okay with you. <laughs> okay. um, so how do you attempt to stay positive with the insanity at the top, getting harder and harder, but more necessary? And how have you continued your vision, even when your own people in position of influence give you pushback? Uh, well, I, I assume that that's a veiled uh, question about Trump. I mean, I, you look, hey. Trump is what he is. I mean, I, I've, uh, as, 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 I, as I stated, th this whole thing starts off with being honest. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, the man has been called a moron and an idiot uh, by his own uh, cabinet members. He's been uh, called a, a, a racist, a misogynist, a xenophobic, a religious bigot, a pathological liar, and a morally degenerate uh, 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 personality. Now, I don't know whether any of that is true. Uh, but from his own words and actions, uh, it might not be true, but he'll do until the real thing comes along. Uh, what, what I'm concerned about is not Trump. I'm concerned about where do we go from here? Uh, because in the end, it has always been we the people who've had to pick up the pieces. And, you know, I, I didn't expect anything coming from Mueller. Mueller's going to put some stuff out there, but th th you can manipulate all kinds of stuff. We, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't expect, I don't expect anything coming out of Congress. It's a political environment. It, it, all kind of manipulations can take place. I don't expect anything coming from Trump other than what he done done. He don't know anything else. Uh, but I do know this, that in the end, it is going to be we, the people, who are going to have to pick up the pieces and clean this mess up. And it may take a couple of generations. Because we see what he's saying and what he's doing on the surface. 
self-evident. What you got to really take a look at is what's happening in these various uh, uh, cabinet positions and so forth and what they're doing to the environment, what they're doing to education, what they're doing uh, to the business thing. You're just talking about appointing um, uh, uh, Steve, uh, what's his name, and uh, uh, Herman Cain to the uh, uh, fe Federal Reserve. Well, I mean, you, 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 you're talking about putting Bozo in charge of the new, uh, economic nukes, you know? So, so at the end of the day, all of that is going to have to be cleaned up, and it's going to be we the people. But I have tremendous faith in our capacities to do that. We came through a civil war, and we picked up the pieces, and that's uh, that, that, that's, what, that's, what we, that's what we do. Came through a bloody labor movement. We picked up the pieces. We came out of it better. Came through a women's suffrage movement. We came out of it with uh, a women's right to vote. But it was we, the people, who finally voted to ratify all of these changes. Came through a bloody civil rights movement where more people were killed between the turn of the 20th century and the death of Martin Luther King than died in the 9-11 towers, uh, 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 plane crashes. But we picked up the, people, the pieces and we came out of it better. We came out of it with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, an environmental movement. We came out of it better. Uh, we're going to come out of the Black Lives Matter movement better. We're gonna, we can, went through a gay rights struggle. We came out of it better. Uh, we're going to come out of it better because that's what we, the people, do. And, and the other thing that we have to be honest about is that there are no final victories. The, civil, the Voting Rights Act didn't end our struggle to get and maintain the vote. We're fighting now what they call voter suppression. Well, that's nothing but blocking folks from voting. That's what, we, that's what the Voting Rights Act was supposed to do. The Civil Rights Act didn't keep this country from putting babies and women, nursing mothers in cages. That struggle goes on. Uh, the, 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 the struggle for, for, for adequate medical services for women didn't end with Roe v. Wade. We're fighting that now. That's what the assaults on Planned Parenthood and Roe v. Wade are about. So, but, but, but in the end, we fight these struggles and we come out of it better. And the thing that I've admonished people to do is never shut down your conversation with those who don't agree with you. That's one of the things I learned early on. Uh, the reason I could work with the NFL, the reason I could work with the ownership of the Warriors, the reason I could work with Major League Baseball, the reason I could work with Bill Walsh was that early on I learned that there's nothing to be gained by shutting down those who you don't agree with. We've got to continue talking to each other. We have got to continue believing in each other. We've got to, you know, I stated, somebody asked me, what is the most important slogan to come out of the 1960s? It wasn't we shall overcome. It wasn't black power. Uh, it wasn't even uh, no uh, justice, no peace. It was keep the faith. Because as long as we keep the faith in each other, in we the people, and in those democratic institutions, we're going to be just fine. And the minute we start shutting them down, we're finished. The minute we give up, we're finished. So when I hear people say, oh, he voted for Trump. I don't have anything. Well, well, you know, I know a lot of people who voted for Trump. But they didn't vote for Trump. They voted for bigger paychecks. They voted for more stable schools. They voted for, let me get the pot of, and the people in these, maybe it's time for us to make a change. A lot of people who voted for Obama voted for Trump. So when you start shutting people down because they don't agree with you, then you're guaranteeing that the difficult, that it's going to be more difficult for us to do what only we can do. We, the people, are going to have to come together in the end and pick the, clean this mess up long after Trump is in the same bag with so many other presidents, so-called, who've been in, people who've been in the Oval Office, you know, uh, that, that have been forgotten and consigned to the nobody list. Uh, Chester Arthur. You, you remember Chester, uh, right? No? No? Well, that's, that's where he's headed. Okay? Th thank you.
Thank, thank you so much. If I had known you were going to, I was going to get that kind of reception, I would have prepared a few remarks. Uh, <laughs>